At this time, we have Scripture. Uh, if you don't have your Bible, either on a printed form or technology, on the back you will find this verse. It's in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. This is one of the awesome parts about the Adventist movement worldwide. We believe in the everlasting gospel, the same gospel we find in the New Testament, we find in the Old, and you'll hear that in these verses. According to Moses, the first gospel writer, Leviticus 19, verses 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke your neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. You shall not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Amen. Let me pray before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm claiming Jeremiah 1, 9. Put your words in my mouth right now. Lord, I pray for the listeners and those that are listening through the online. Lord, I pray that you'll penetrate, penetrate through their minds and their hearts. The sermon, it hit me. You hit me with it, the Holy Spirit. And I pray that we all learn that, Lord, we need to learn to love thy neighbor. Lord, take control now. I ask for the Holy Spirit. I just plead for the Holy Spirit right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. <clears throat> Love thy neighbor as yourself. The world is in a mess as we see it. We know that it will continue to go down and get worse and worse because the Bible says so. That's why. The whole world is mad at each other. We see it on television. We hear it on the radios. We see the news continue to show this person against this person. America is crumbling little by little. You have to be blind if you don't see it. Totally blind. What caused this mess? Sin has caused this mess. Sin had caused this. From the beginning, Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world. The temperature was perfect. Every grass, every herb yielding seed, every fruit tree yielding fruits after its kind. It was perfect. It was all perfect. God dressed their home. God put all the plants out there for them. All the trees they can choose from, but he only said, this one, don't touch it. This one is mine. One out of millions that he created. Don't touch this one. So until our first parents disobeyed, and Eve listened to that snake, which he lied to her. She took it, she took a bite, and she gave to her husband, and he took it. And this is where we're at. That sin, disobedience. And God says, do not eat of the knowledge of good or evil. He didn't want it to touch that. That was the simplest test. Sister White said that was the simplest test he gave to Adam and Eve. One tree, don't touch it. And they fell. And we know in Genesis 4, they had children, Cain and Abel. Cain was the tiller of the ground, and Abel was the keeper of the sheep. And God required on how to bring their offerings to worship him. They were taught from their parents. They both were to bring spotless lamb and sacrifice it on the altar. 
But Cain brought what? He brought his fruits, his best of his fruits. Now tell me, does fruits bleed red blood? No. He brought the best banana. He brought the best apple, the best pear, the best orange. But God didn't require that. He said, a spotless lamb, bring it to me. Abel did exactly what God said. Abel, God accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain. And Cain was wroth with his brother because God did not accept his fruits. Ever since that, man has hated his brother. And we see it to this day. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed at all. We know the rest of the story. Cain killed his brother Abel just because he did exactly what God said. I read in Patriots and Prophets, page 71.1, and it says there, read it with me. Cain and Abel, the son of Adam, differed widely in character. Abel had a spirit of loyalty to God. He saw justice and mercy in the Creator's dealing with the fallen race and gratefully accepted the hope of redemption. But Cain cherished feelings of rebellion and murmured against God. Listen, he murmured against God. Because of that curse pronounced upon the earth and upon the human race of Adam's sin, he permitted his mind to run in the same channel that led Satan's fall, indulging the desire of self-exaltation and questioning the divine justice and authority. That's powerful. Cain had the same mindset as Satan. God tell him, listen, bring a lamb. I want you to bring a spotless lamb. But him, he goes and gets fruit and puts that on the altar and expects God to bring fire down and devour that. That's disobedience. And we live in a world of disobedience. We live in a world of disobedience. You see, the devil's plan is for us to question God. Did God say that? Did God really mean that? What's the answer, people? Yes, he said what he means, and he means what he said. Everything in this Bible is truth. Every word, every black print that you see is truth. God said it. Who are we to change what God said? No man is supposed to change anything God said. No man. To disagree with God is putting yourself in dangerous grounds. God is looking for people to stand up for him and to show his character. Let's look at the character of Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That is their Hebrew names, as we know them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Babylonian names. How did Daniel and his friends show Love thy neighbor as thyself. In Daniel 1, we know that King Nebuchadnezzar took many Hebrews to Babylon. Well, one day, the king had a dream. He had a really bad dream. And he called in his magicians, he called in his astrologers, he called his sorcerers, his Chaldeans. He said, listen, I had a bad dream, but I can't, I can't tell you about it. Again, I, I can't remember it, but you guys that are on my payroll, tell me what it's all about. All these guys were on his payroll. Daniel and the three Hebrew boys were on his payroll too. But Daniel wasn't in that, that, in that, that meeting, that first meeting with them, because he heard. And he said, listen, if you guys don't tell me about my dream, I'm going to kill you all. 
And that news got to Daniel and his three friends. Why is the king so mad? Why is he upset? So Daniel went in and asked the king, listen, give us some time. Give us some time. We'll get back to you. So the king granted his wish. So Daniel went back with his three Hebrew friends and had an all-night prayer meeting. An all-night prayer meeting. And God listened to Daniel. God listened, and he showed him the whole dream to Daniel. Every word. So Daniel went to the king, and he revealed the dream, every part of it, from the image. He showed him the image. And you can, you can imagine the king sitting there with his hands over his long beard and said, yep, yep, I, I know I saw an image. Are you right? And then he said, hey, you saw the head of gold. Yep, that's right, Daniel. You're saying it. And you saw the arms of silver. You saw the breastplate of brass. You saw the long legs of iron. You saw the feet of iron mixed with clay. You saw the rock that was cut out of a mountain and it smashed the feet, listen, it smashed the feet of the image because that's what the Bible says. Not at the legs and not at the arm. And destroyed all of it. He interpreted the whole thing to the king. And then this is what came out of the king's mouth. The king answered unto Daniel after he interpreted everything and said, O oh, of truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing that couldest reveal this secret. He knew that nobody else can reveal this. But Daniel interpreted everything according to everything that, that King Nebuchadnezzar dreamt. You are on it. Your God, he said, your God is the God of God and the revealer of all secrets. Listen, what Daniel did right there, love thy neighbor as thyself. How did he do that? None of the wise men died that day. He prayed for all of them. They would have been killed. Daniel stood as a high priest. And God revealed it to him. And those astrologers, you can imagine those astrologers and those magicians and everybody that's on his payroll, they were anticipating, what is Daniel going to say? Their life was on what Daniel was going to tell the, the king. <laughs> he loved his neighbor as himself. They didn't die that day. His three Hebrew friends prayed for deliverance, and God answered. God answered every prayer. Jesus came to show us how this was done. And I had a question. When Jesus was on earth, did Jesus join any political party on earth? What's the answer? No. Did Jesus join any religious group like the Pharisees or the Sadducees? No. That means Jesus had total trust in doing his Father's will. In Matthew 12, 50, and I want to, I want to remind about the Ten Commandments first. This is the character of God. The first four is how we relate with Christ. How I will have no other gods before him. I will make no other graven image. I will not take the name of God in vain. I will remember to keep the Sabbath holy. And the last six is how I deal with my neighbor. I'm not going to dishonor my parents. I am not going to kill. 
I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to bear false witness against my neighbor. And I'm not going to covet anything my neighbor has. That's the character of Jesus Christ. Daniel and his three friends had that. They had this. You and I have to have that same character if we're going to enter into the, to the pearly gates. You got, you, we have to have all ten. We can't go into heaven just keeping nine. I'm going to tell you that right now. We know that from James 2.10. If I break one, I broke them all. If I broke one, I could keep the Sabbath. I don't have no images in my house. I could do all these things. But if I have jealousy toward my brother, I'm lost. If I have envy against my brother, I'm lost. If I'm backbiting, very false witnessing, I'm lost. That's why it's so important that we keep all Ten Commandments. You hear people out there say, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. That's the devil's talk when you hear that. That's how the devil talks to people. When you hear people like that, you just turn and do an about face. That's the devil's talking. So we know Jesus took 12 guys and uh, he was trying to show him his, his character, these 12 men. And he said, whosoever shall do the will of my father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother, my sister, my mother. Jesus came to show how to deal with his neighbor. Jesus took these men and they observed, they watched how Jesus interacted with people that they knew they wouldn't hang out with. They wouldn't hang out with uh, a tax collector. They wouldn't hang around with the people that do drugs or drinking all the time. They wouldn't do that, but Jesus dealt with that. Jesus showed them how to deal with them because he came to save them from their sins. That's from Matthew 121. It says that Jesus came to save them from their sins, not in their sins, hello, from their sins. People are misquoting the scriptures. And Jesus showed them a story of a woman caught in adultery. Now imagine all this. Jesus is teaching early in the morning, and there's a good group of people sitting there listening to Jesus preach. Then suddenly, you hear a little commotion from the back coming in. People scrounging, people calling whore and calling all this and that. And the noise gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then suddenly Jesus has to stop. And their commotion, adulterous, and they're calling this lady all types of things. And they threw this woman in front of Jesus. Probably her hair is a mess, full of dust, full of spit. And everybody's watching. What is Jesus going to do? And Jesus bent down on the dirty floor and started writing on the floor. And I couldn't imagine what Jesus was writing. Liars. Adulterers. Backbiters, covered thing, stealing from widows and widowers. These guys had their stones in their hands. They were ready to throw the first stone, this lady. And think about this. Why wasn't the man that they caught in adultery wasn't there? Jesus knew what they were doing. He saw, he saw their motives, why they brought this woman. They wanted to catch Jesus. They wanted to just trap him. And I love how Jesus tells them in their face, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast the first stone. And then suddenly you hear boom, 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 boom. 
boom, boom, rocks falling on the ground, one by one. And the Bible says it started with the eldest to the youngest. They were convicted. They all dropped and walked away. And then there, you see the woman and just Jesus alone. Amen. That's the best place to be, is at the feet of Jesus. You need a one-on-one. -on -one. We all need a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. We all need a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And it says there in verse 10, Jesus said, woman, where is thou our accusers? Has no man condemned thee? And I love verse 11. And when she says, yes, uh, she said, no man, Lord. Now, listen how she said that. And I got the meaning of it. When she said, no man, Lord. When she says, Lord, she said, you are the only one that can pick up that rock and stone it at me. And what did Jesus say right after that? Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Right there is a whole sermon all by itself. That's a whole sermon all by itself. Sin no more. And this world is just full of sin. Full to the top. We all know that she was guilty. She broke the law. She was to die because she broke the law. But Jesus came to show mercy and forgiveness. Amen. <laughs> he showed mercy and forgiveness. Love thy neighbor as thyself. And I love this quote from Desire of Ages. Christ hates the sin, but he loves what? The sinner. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. Christian love is slow to censor, quick to discern penitence, ready to forgive, to encourage, to set the wanderers on the path of holiness, and to stay his feet therein. Listen, I saw this with my own eyes. This was in... in um, at the headquarters in Maryland. There was a bunch of pastors. They had a meeting at the GC. And I know, I think it was C.D. Brooks spoke. And after he spoke, the next speaker was Dwayne um, um, Nelson from Andrews University. He stood up and he confessed in front of everybody there. He said, I, be, I had a jealousy of a man in this room for a very long time. This is a pastor talking about another pastor. And he was jealous. He was jealous of Mark Finley. Mark Finley jumped from his seat, first row, and ran on stage and hugged him and forgave him. They started praying right there. Can you imagine a pastor hating another pastor? Jealous? He's going to lose his salvation over jealousy? That was powerful. This is what Sister White wrote. You got to be fast to forgive people if someone offended you. You got to let stuff go. You can't be holding people that hold on to grudges, holding on, oh, that person did me wrong 40 years or 20 years ago, will put you in the burning pit. That will put you in a burning Why are you going to lose your salvation over that? But what I saw with my own eyes, I saw what Mark Finley did, just what she said. He was ready to forgive. He got up. Now, most people will say, that's his problem. I'll just sit back here. That's his problem. He's jealous of me. That's all right. That's what most people would do. But what Mark Finley did, that showed me Christ. That's the character of Christ. 
we have to be ready to forgive those that offend us. I have people, I have family members that talk about me, call me Mr. Goody Two Shoes, Mr. Know It All. I'm just a simple guy trying to do God's will. I'm no better than anybody. I didn't go to no, no school, no big school, and got any DMVs or anything like that, no masters in, 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 in theology. I'm just a basic guy. I'm just like, I'm a just fisherman, you could say that. I'm Peter, I'm Paul, just like that, just basic guy. But I let God use me. And there's people that are jealous of that. It's the truth, I'm not lying about this. What I'm trying to get across, my brothers and sisters, if you're holding something against someone, you better stop. You are not going to enter the kingdom. I'm going to tell you my personal story. I used to sit in the back of the church. This is back in Michigan. And I used to be like this, sit in the back. And my eyes were on the pastor, the pastor's wife, the elders, the elder's wife, the deacons, the deacon's wife. I wasn't paying attention to no sermon. I want to see how they react. I left church for a while until my mom invited me to see this young, young kid preaching. She said, come and listen to this young kid. This kid, I saw him before. He had tattoos all over his arm, all the way up around his neck. But God took a kid like that to help me. So I was sitting, listening to this kid, sitting up on the balcony. I didn't want nobody to see me. Far in the back. And I'm listening to this kid. His name is David Asterick. Many of you know who that is. This is way back in the early 90s. He, was just, he just came into the faith. But I was born in the faith. But I was lost. Do you hear me? I was lost. God took a kid, brought him in to teach me how to love thy neighbor and not to look at them differently. That's what Jesus did for me. Remember, Jesus hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Jesus is, the, is in the business of saving souls. Amen? How many of you believe that? I do, and I praise God. The best story of all times is when Jesus was dying on the cross, but is willing to stop dying for a little bit to save his neighbor slash his brother that was in the same predicament as he was. This man was convicted that this is Jesus. Think about it. Jesus, they, the Roman soldiers put him on this wood, put his hands out, took some big nails, took a large hammer, and started welling in his hands, both hands and his feet. Jesus didn't curse. He didn't swear. They hung him up on that, on, on that pole, right next to these guys. And then the crowd that came by, cursing and swearing at Jesus, calling him all this, oh, if you're the son of God, you could come down. They will not believe you. Jesus could have come down, but he had to die to save us. And Jesus just said, forgive them, for they what? For they know not what they do. That man that was next to Jesus heard that. He saw it. And he was convinced this is the Son of God. He was convinced. And Jesus promised him, because he says, remember me when you go into your paradise, right? And we know that the brother right now He's asleep, waiting for Jesus to come. He is not in paradise right now. We know he's waiting for the 
a resurrection, that Jesus is coming, that first resurrection, when all the saints were gathered together and going with him together. That's what the Bible says. He was convinced. Jesus stopped for a second to save another soul. And that story was there for you and me. That story was there for you and me. Oh, Jesus took time to, to stop dying to save a neighbor. Do you have time to stop by and say hello to your neighbor? How about ask your neighbor or your friend to stop by to have hot tea or some hot chocolate? Invite a friend or a neighbor over for a bonfire just to get to know them. Stop by and visit the sick and bring some food or fruits to them. Jesus would do that. Jesus would do that. Listen, if you think by just sitting here and going like this and laying back in the pews, you're not going to make it. I heard C.D. Brooks preach about that. He goes, he's going to be a bunch of people that sit back in the church, sitting back in the pews, are not going to make it. Because they think they're already set. I'm baptized. My name is written in the book down here. But it's not written in the books up there. The book of life. There's going to be books. Remember, S, books. There's going to be a lot of people's name on that. And they're not going to enter into the pearly gates. Be careful. This is my warning, brothers and sisters. If you're holding something against somebody, you're not going to make it like this. You got to come and confess. If I did something wrong to any of you here, please let me know. If I looked at you wrong or I said something to you wrong, please forgive me. I don't want to, I really don't want to lose my salvation over one thing. I don't, no envy, no jealousy. I pray for people that talk about me or say something about my family, that the Lord would change them. <laughs> the devil is good in keeping our eyes on things here on earth. He's good at that. He's constantly keeping us busy on the television and all type of social media. People get round up when they see stuff on Facebook. Why well, believe this and I believe that? You better believe in Jesus Christ. I want to go and visit different planets, the whole universe with Jesus. Why? Let one thing keep me out of the kingdom. And I've been reading the, the book of Maranatha. That's been my devotional this year, the Maranatha book. That's a powerful book. And I'm right toward the end. All those people that are outside of the city, millions of people will be outside of the city. And they're going to say, why? Because they love their stuff. They exalted themselves. They were high and mighty. They had jealousy. They had anger, murdering. And this week, um, um, she was saying that the, the mother of Napoleon would find out why her son Nero is so evil. How she allowed that boy, while raising him, to be so devilish is the word. His sins, her sins, is on her, on her son. He killed a lot of Christians. They will be in the city with white robes, with their crowns, praising God. And all those million people will be outside saying, man, I wish I could have been in there. But it'll be too late. There's, no, there's, no, there's not going to be no second chance. People really think that. Your only chance is now. It's now, right now. I have to make changes in my life. 
I can't continue like this. I want everyone in this place and those that are listening online, I want you to be saved. And what the Holy Spirit was convicting me this week while I was putting this together. One. It only takes one and you'll be out. Am I holding anything? Like they call it, a pet sin. People think, oh, I can have this little pet sin right here. Nobody's going to know about it. It's right here. That pet sin's going to burn you at the end of the day. We got to let go. Drinking, smoking, adultery, everything. You got to let go and don't hold on to it. Ask Jesus to help you. He helped me and I know he will help you. Please, brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, do I really love Jesus with all my heart and all my soul? The first four. In the last six, do I really love my brothers and sisters, my neighbors, even family members? Yes, family may talk about you. If you're doing God's will, pray for them. Because I had it done to me, and it's still doing it to me. People say, oh, you're so holy, you so this and that. If you're doing God's will, you're doing right. They're going to call you a lot of names coming toward the end now. They're going to call you a lot of names. You better get ready. You better get ready for what's coming. The thing is to be sure with you and Jesus that you're not going to let go. It's your crown. Don't let no one take it. Don't let nobody take it. It's not worth it. It's not. Think about it. I love all you people. And I, I thank you how the way you treated me and my family out here in Dunlap. There were people that told me not to come to Dunlap. I'm going to tell you that right now. Listen, these were people from the church. Told me, don't come out to Dunlap. Don't visit this place. And it's been the best thing under the sun. I rave about Dunlap. And I tell my friends, I love it. God did right. He did me right and to my family. He did me right. What if I didn't listen to him and I stayed right where, where I was at? Never came out to Dunlap. I just praise God. He did the right thing and I did the right thing coming out here. And I came on a Wednesday night to this church on a Wednesday night. And the way you people treated me when I walked in, sharing and Mrs. McEwen and a whole bunch of people came and they hugged me first night I came and walked into this church on a Wednesday. That's love. I saw Jesus in them. And I've been to a lot of churches, brothers and sisters. I've been to churches where no one says, not even hello. I'll walk in, I'm just like, like a fly. I stand in some churches, I've been there like visiting three or four times, my wife was a witness. We stand right in the middle, not one person came over and said, hey, I noticed that you knew people, not one person came and shook our hands. Not one. And God is my witness. We can't go to heaven like this. When a new visitor walks through that door, we should be loving them. Show them that we're so happy to see them walk through the door. That's what Jesus have us. We have to be disciples of Jesus. We can't be disciples of Satan. Care for our own selves. We have to stop. And Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, what he says Keep my command. That is in red. That's in your Bible. It's in my Bible. It's in red. Jesus spoke out of his own mouth. How hard is it? How hard is it to do what Jesus says? We can't do it on our own. I'll tell you that right now. I tried, and it doesn't work. Let me just give you that right now. 
on your own strength, it will never work. But with Jesus, all things are what? Possible. Is there anyone here today that needs help loving others? Raise your hand and I'll pray for you. I'll be the first. It is hard, but with Jesus, we can do it. The thing is, don't let the devil really, really control your mind and put stuff in your head. And so, oh, is that person thinking about me? Is that person saying something about me or this person? You got to stop that. You got to take that to Jesus. You got to fall down and beg Jesus, take that out of my head. Literally. Don't talk about anybody. Help the Lord to control your mouth. If you're talking to another brother or sister, if you see your neighbor outside and they're struggling with grocery or something, get out and go and help them. Help them put it in. I really don't want nobody to, to lose their salvation. I, I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. And I pray. Say, Lord, please help me this week to love my neighbor. Just call up a person that you know, someone that's sick. I know a sister this week, she said, I wanted to be here. I know she's not here. She was, I wanted to come because I know you were preaching. But, you know, she has some issues, and I told her I'll still be praying. I know she wanted to come, but she's sick. There's so many sick people around us. but they need the love of Jesus and you are the one. Sister White says that we'll be meeting people that when they're in the kingdom, they're gonna come running to you and say, thank you because you show me Jesus by your actions, by your words. They're gonna be running and saying, thank you. You show me. They never step into a church ever. They will be there. It's the character of Jesus Christ. That's all I'm trying to tell you guys. It's simple. We have to have the character of Jesus Christ if we're going to get off this ground. The faster we do everything that Jesus tells us to do, the faster Jesus will be here. That's it. Period. Period. The faster we resemble and do his character, the faster he'll come. Are you sick and tired of this world? I am. I'm tired. I'm really tired. I got aches and pains. I didn't think I was going to stand here. Literally. I was going to Omni Rehab. My back was killing me. I was going to ask somebody else to preach for me this Sabbath. But I asked the Lord, please help me. You gave me these things to preach. Praise God. I can stand. I'm not even thinking about my back. This is all God. He's real. And many of you prayed for me when I had COVID. These are answers from God. These are all examples. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the sermon. Thank you for the message. Thank you for speaking through me, Lord. I know it was the Holy Spirit that walked in. I pray. Lord, you saw the hands of the people that rose that said, please, Lord, help me to love my neighbor as thyself, Lord. This is tough for all of us. But Lord, with you, we can do all things. Praise God. Lord, help us to love our neighbors. And those that talk about us, still to love them. Those that persecute us, still to love them. Because they persecuted, they persecuted you, Lord. Church members put you on the cross. Church members, Sabbath keepers, put you on the cross. Oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you continue to do. Help us while we live in this small town of Dunlap that we can reflect Jesus Christ wherever we go, Walmart, to the bank, to the gas station, wherever we go, Lord. Our workplaces, our bosses, coworkers, students, that they can see Jesus in us, in our smile, 
and the way that we talk back to them. Give a person a hug. Take out a hand and shake their hands. Bring them a little bread, just a simple bread. We'll change this whole world upside down. Lord, help us to be disciples. We thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.